Hello, my Art 100 students. I am so excited for today's lecture as we continue our discussion about modernism and really the fundamental question about what is art. Um, I'm going to review a little bit and just remind you that we talked last time about Picasso very, very specifically, and we also talked about kind of the fundamental ideas about modernism and that it is this loose term broadly defined to, um, to somehow be a reflection of one's own time. And that this expression, less is more, is one of the kind of the key expressions that sums up um, ideas about the modern world. And I wanted you guys to think about that and, and ask yourselves if you've experienced that less is more um, concept and uh, what it means to you. So what is art and um, really how do artists respond to the modern world, to the legacy of art that came before and very specifically how are artists going to respond to Picasso and what he did and we talked a lot about Picasso in the last lecture and I just want to remind you that um, in 1907, he makes this painting, Demoiselle d'Avignon, that shakes up the art world. But I wanted you guys to really recall that, in fact, when he's a very young boy, he can draw like this. He can draw like Michelangelo. So why would an artist choose to move from something like this to this? Um, and these are sort of the fundamental questions. And they, the answer really comes in terms of what is the artistic intent? We started our course with this concept and we are going to end our course with the concept. All art has intent, meaning that all art has an idea behind it. Um, and that I, those ideas vary, right? An artist's intention can be to make art about nothing or make art about randomness or make art about beauty or war or, you know, an infinite number of things. How artists respond to the modern world is of course going to be reflected in their art. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually look at responses to, um, to Picasso and responses to this question, what is art? And we're going to actually do it geographically. Okay, so we're going to start with Italy. And the movement in Italy that is um, really a response to Picasso and Cubism is called Italian Futurism. Um, and it's interesting because it's actually a right wing rather than a left wing movement begun in 1909. Um, and the Italian futurists are in love with the idea of progress and speed and motion. And one of the founders of the movement is so in love and so enthusiastic about technology that he actually names his own daughter Propeller. So imagine being so enthusiastic about that, that you name your own daughter Propeller. This sculpture that I am showing you, um, which is called The Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, 1913. Have a look at this sculpture, right? Um, because 1913 was what, 107 years ago? And look at how incredibly modern this thing still looks today. As a matter of fact, here are some photographs of it um, in the Museum of Modern Art. And um, I took these pictures a few years ago. And you can actually see, um, some of my students are like, oh my god, it, it sort of looks like Darth Vader. You know, it looks like... Uh, you know, it's an incredibly modern sculpture. And um, I wanted you guys to just, you know, really kind of see that this thing is made, you know, quite a while ago and that it has a very powerful vision, right? And the artist, Boccioni, who's also a painter, is trying to capture this idea of movement and speed and dynamism and energy. That is the artistic intent of the Italian futurists. So today we take most technological advances for granted, right? Um, but at the turn of this last century, innovations like electricity and x-rays and radio waves and automobiles and airplanes were extremely exciting, right? And these were things, these were the subject 
that the Italian futurists wanted to uh, make as, as the things they wanted to celebrate. And it's even more interesting because when you think about Italy, right, the country's artistic reputation is grounded in ancient art, in Renaissance art, and, you know, everything about the past. So in the early 1900s, this group of young and rebellious Italian writers and artists emerge to celebrate industrialization. They're frustrated by Italy's declining status, and they believe that the machine age would result in an entirely new world order and even in a renewed world consciousness. Now, I want to show you this because you guys should remember um, this beautiful sculpture on the left that we talked about. It is Hellenistic art, Greek art, and you can see that also by the date, right around 200 BC, right? So this sculpture is about 2,200 years old. Um, and I just wanted to show it to you next to the Boccioni piece because the Italian futurists themselves said that our work of art is more beautiful than the Nike of Samothrace. So take a minute and just um, compare and contrast these two sculptures. Um, clearly they're made out of a different material, um, marble versus polished bronze, um, but they're similar in a lot of ways as well, right? This, this idea of motion, the leaning forward, the effect of the wind pushing back against the muscles of the, of the figure. So imagine that you are a person in 1913 and you want to kind of announce that you have this very powerful idea and you're going to create a movement and you know, on and on and on. Well, you can't just go onto Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever to let people know what your concept is. You literally need to take a, an ad out in the paper. And you can see here in the lower left-hand corner, right, you see here on the cover of Le Figaro, the French newspaper, um, the Italian futurists published their manifesto. And it was, you know, calling for a, a whole new world, literally a revolution. They wanted to destroy museums and libraries, and, and they wanted to just embrace only things that are about the future. Um, so it's a really, really interesting thing. I think that this idea of motion and energy and dynamism, which is what the Italian futurists are trying to capture in their art, is very, very well captured here. Right, so look at this painting. So this is now the same artist, right? You guys see that? It's Umberto Boccioni, the same artist. And now here he is making a painting. And the painting, in fact, called The City Rises, 1910, he is, in fact, trying to capture, again, this idea of movement and motion and energy. So if I said to you guys, okay, I want you to make a piece of art or make a painting that captures movement, how would you do it? And you can see it here, sort of this, these repetitive forms and this, um, you know, quick brush strokes and kind of, you, you feel the power, you feel the energy of the piece. And we know that the um, Italian futurists were very, very taken by photography and time-lapse photography. And that in fact, um, they studied this um, this video that uh, Etienne Jules Marais made um, in about 1885. So it's really interesting to see how they could apply these principles to their paintings. So that was Italy and their response to um, Cubism, to what Picasso was doing. Um, and now, as I mentioned, we're going to go to another geographic area um, and we're going to actually talk about Russia and the Russian avant-garde and what's happening there. And I want you guys to just remember, um, if you can, I'm sure everybody read 
the book Animal Farm. And you can actually um, think about some of the principles and sort of the context of what's going on in Russia at the time, right? There's this kind of extremely corrupt government uh, that's very incompetent and anachronistic, led by the Russian czar. Um, there's centuries of oppression and, um, you know, this kind of uh, lower class surf culture. Um, there's urban overcrowding and poor conditions. And uh, Russia pretty much debilitated further by the First World War. And what happens is there's this movement um, called the Bol Bolshevik Revolution um, that is happening right around the same time that the Russian suprematist artists are in fact trying to make art. And it's within that context that I want you to think about uh, some of the images that we're going to look at. Because if you look at this painting by Kazimir Malevich, you'll see that it is in fact uh, really the most abstract um, piece of art that we've looked at so far, right? Abstract, um, even to the point where it is non-objective. The problem is that Malevich names this piece suprematist composition, but then he adds the words airplane flying. So everyone's looking at it like, okay, where's the airplane? I don't see it. Is that the propeller, the red thing? Like what's going on here in this painting? And so even though he wants to make art that he says is his desperate attempt to free art from the burden of the object, right? That what he's saying is making representational art and trying to make a painting look like something that exists in the real world as a burden, he still can't completely let go uh, of that. And he puts the burden of the, the object back into his work of art in the title. So it's an interesting thing to think about, right? You guys, you need to remember that the title of a painting that is given to it by an artist is, is part of the artistic intent, right? It's another element of the art. The artist himself or herself um, is choosing that. So um, what's interesting though, is that these Russian suprematists are trying to, to create um, what they call utopian art, right? They're trying to create art that breaks free of social classes that anyone can understand. And so the idea is that potentially, you know, anyone can understand um, a square or a rectangle, right? And you don't have to be, you know, kind of a person from an upper middle class background who maybe has the opportunity to take a beach vacation. Right. So not everyone gets to do that. And so we're sort of back to this. We're back to this image that we looked at last class. And here you can see the comparison between the Monet and the Malevich. And yes, it is Malevich who, who made this painting on the right, the square on square. So by making an art that he says is accessible to everybody um, and free from the burden of the object, they're trying to be um, utopian, right? in the sense that there might be a pure language of shape or color that everybody can respond to in an intuitive way, no matter where in the world you come from. And so I think it's a really interesting thing. I'm not saying I agree with it. Um, and I'm curious what you guys think about that. And here is, um, again, some of his other works. And I'm so I'm just going to make these titles a little bit smaller. But Again, even though they're, they're pretty abstract, or they are completely non-objective, right? By calling them realism of a football player or airplane flying, we are still kind of chained to that idea of, you know, where is it? Where is the object that I, I can recognize? Where is that dang airplane? Um, and I wanted to show you this. This has kind of always been exciting to me. This is an installation, I think, at the Museum of Modern Art. And these people are, um, they're not only making paintings, but even they're making a piece of furniture here that kind of um, is consistent with these beliefs and these uh, ideas that they're exploring. 
um, and don't don't think that they weren't interested in um, somehow <laughs> creating a, you know an opportunity for a, a commercial enterprise right you can see oops I'm drawing from this thing that here is a suprematist teapot made in the Lomonosov factory um, and you know they they're they have this radical idea they have this hope for a new society um, and they're making objects that kind of is con are consistent with that vision um, and they're also saying that artists need to have an important role in creating the vision of this new future um, and creating beautiful things for for life and for everyday life so um, I wanted you guys to see this beautiful teapot. Another really interesting movement um, is called the, the Dada movement. And we're going to talk a lot about the Dada movement. And in particular, this one artist whose name is Marcel Duchamp. Um, so I wanted to um, just show you this guy, this Hugo Ball. And he's dressed up on the right in this crazy, crazy costume. And he says, I don't want words that other people have invented, right? All the words are other people's inventions. I want my own stuff, my own rhythm, vowels and consonants too, matching my own rhythm. And um, like the Italian futurists, um, they're experimenting with writing and performance. And this, this poem, this carawane, um, is just sort of like a, a nonsense poetry um, that embraces the idea of randomness, right? They, they made up this, this language. And um, ironically, I think I found a video once of Marie Osmond, of all people, um, reciting the poem. <laughs> Let me see if I can find that for you guys. Hold on one second. Okay, here it is. I found it. Let's see if I can play it for you guys. Marie Osmond reciting the Karawane poem. So you can, you can see the words here on the left. Karawane doli fanto blamba o fale hambla. Grosse gama patla habla horami gaga goleman. High glow blow aiko rasula huju. Holaka holala. And logobang. Blagobang. Blagobang baso putaka. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Shampa uwala wasa. Olobo. <laughs> Sounds like uh, the language they speak in um, Game of Thrones. Anyway, <clears throat> the the language of the Dothraki. That's what it was. I had to look up the, the language in Game of Thrones. But um, one of the key figures in um, the Dada movement is this guy named Marcel Duchamp. And you can see his name here, Marcel Duchamp. And interestingly, he is one of those people like Pablo Picasso um, who goes through many, many different phases and uh, becomes a really important figure in um, kind of modern art, I would say. And one of the things that um, I really want to talk about is less about his painting here, but more about this concept that he invents and he names uh, called the ready-made. And this is just, it's actually a part of my class that my students really, really fall in love with and fall in love with and they really enjoy. And it's a, it's a kind of an interesting thing to think about. And um, he's beginning to really question what what does it take to make a piece of art and what is art and so he invents this concept of the ready made and it literally means that he goes into in this case with the bottle rack he goes into um, a flea market and he's walking along and he sees this object that is um, you know a mass-produced manufactured in a factory by someone else object that I guess was used to dry bottles in 1914 and he chooses it he says I like that I am going to pick it 
and I'm going to give it a name and maybe I'm going to sign my name on it and I am going to say this is mine. This is my art. This is something that I am making a piece of art because I am choosing it to be so. It is my artistic intent. And that's really kind of the definition of a ready-made. And the question is, you know, do you agree? Is it okay? to say that something is a piece of art because you have chosen it and you have named it such. And if you guys remember at the beginning of the semester, I talked about this idea. What is the difference between a twisted piece of metal that you found on the street and that exact same piece of twisted piece of metal that a famous artist found on the street, picked it up, signed his name to it, and put it in a gallery with a price tag of $30,000. You know, what is the difference between these two twisted pieces of metal? And I would say that the difference is that is the idea behind it, right? The artistic intent and that somebody has chosen it. And so this is basically the concept of what a ready-made is. And we're gonna see some incredible examples of um, Marcel Duchamp very specifically this wild story of how he makes a ready-made um, out of a urinal. So I'm going to show you guys the video of the whole story about the, the ready-made urinal um, that Marcel Duchamp um, submits to a sculpture exhibition um, and the huge uproar that's created when he does that. Okay, so here we go. I'll be right back. We're at SFMOMA and we're looking at uh, Marcel Duchamp. This is Fountain, which he originally made in 1917 but mm -hmm. which he remade in 1964. The original got was gone. Thrown yeah. away or yeah. who knows what. So this is a small series that was made in 1964 after that original work of 1917 and he oversaw the making of this I think we series. need to be really careful with the word making. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go there. What Duchamp did, of course, is he went to a plumbing supply house that was called Mott and <laughs> um, purchased this. And okay, he, so he didn't make it. Right, so he made it as a work of art through the alchemy of the artist, transformed yeah. this. He turned the urinal on its side right. and, and signed it our Mott and dated it. And submitted it to an art exhibition for a new group that he was a founding member of, the American Society for Independent Artists. And their notion was that the juried exhibition that was prevalent in the United States and New York at this time, and remember, Duchamp had just come over from Paris, was in fact a real problem because the jury always selected the traditional work that they were associated with. And this new group wanted to bring in new possibilities. Right, so they were supposed to accept every work that was submitted, but they rejected this one. Well, I think he was really pushing the boundaries. Well, he submitted it as sculpture, well, and if, which to me is even more remarkable because when you think about sculpture, it has an even more monumental, heroic tradition, yes. tradition than even than painting to take this urinal and turn it on its side. Some art historians have dealt with this in the most absurd way, talking about its formal qualities with its shiny its curves, porcelain surface, but it's a urinal, although it is transformed. And this is, of course, what Duchamp called a ready-made. Well, you used the word alchemy before, and I think that that's an interesting word because one of the ways we can think about what art is, is a kind of transformation of ordinary materials into something really wonderful that transports us and that makes us see things in a new way. And though he didn't make anything, he is asking us to see the urinal in a new way, not necessarily as an aesthetic object, but to make us ask those philosophical questions about what art is and what the artist does. But he separates craftsmanship and its relationship to the aesthetic, to aesthetic enjoyment and to the profundity of a work of art, just absolutely throwing Right, that's the, the philosophical window. question he wants to open up. Does art have to be made by the hand of the artist? And of course he's doing it in the most absurd way by putting a urinal forward, calling it fountain. So what is art? Is it the idea? Is it the concept? Can an artist just have the idea and not make the object? Can art be pure philosophy, pure theory? Exactly. Thank you.
So I hope that you guys enjoyed that video. I, I love the two of them when they're bantering back and forth. Um, but I think that one of the things that's really important and really interesting about, um, you know, this, this whole thing with the urinal is that they ask the fundamental question, you know, what is art? And, you know, what is it that the artist does? And does something actually have to be made by the hand of the artist to, for it to be called a piece of art? Um, and you'll see here by sort of the quote that came from one of the articles uh, about the piece was that whether Mr. Mutt, by the way, Mutt, that he signs the piece of art, would be, was a famous plumbing company, so it would be as if you're signing a toilet, uh, Mr. Kohler or, or, you know, Mr. whoever, Mr. Toto, who makes the toilets. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life. He turns it upside down, so he places it so that its useful significance disappears. And then under the new title, he creates a new thought for that object. And that's really what's happening here with this, with this work of art. Um, so I guess one of the one of the things that's kind of crazy about it is, and, and this is really interesting, this was a, a just a, an article that appeared and they called it the Richard Mutt case. And um, basically, uh, as you saw in the video, Marcel Duchamp is a member of a, a sculpture society and they're having a call for objects to have an exhibition. And because he's a member, his work, whatever it would be, should automatically be admitted to the show. Um, and they say that any artist who will pay $6 will have their work of art, their piece of sculpture, admitted to the exhibit. So Mr. Richard Mott, the, the fake artist, he's really Duchamp, right? He sends in his fountain. It's not a fountain, it's a urinal. And um, it was, uh, it, it was accepted, but it was never really exhibited. It was stuck in the corner where no one could see it, probably behind a door. And so the article goes on to say, what were the grounds for this work of art being refused, right? Well, some people said it was considered immoral or vulgar. Some people said it was plagiarism. Okay, and I want you guys to think about that. We've had discussions in the class about that before, right? Is, you know, is he stealing this from someone else? The, 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 the urinal designer person? Is that, you know, who really should be given credit for this work of art? So that was one of the comments that it was plagiarism. Now, Mr. Mutt's fountain is not immoral. That is absurd. No more than a bathtub is immoral. It's a fixture that you see every day. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view and created a new thought for the object. And so this is really the most kind of comprehensive way uh, and the most extreme example to think about what it is that Duchamp means and what we mean when we talk about this concept of a ready-made. Duchamp goes on to create many other ready-made works of art, many other ready-made objects. And this is actually one of them, the, the bicycle wheel. And, you know, you can see um, that it's, it's not that far from the original work of art that it was. Um, and it becomes kind of an important work of art to the surrealists. Um, Picasso made a ready-made, and here's a, a ready-made by Pablo Picasso. He called it the bull's head. And if you can remember back to our earlier discussions about the bull, uh, in Guernica, Picasso really kind of related to the bull um, and it's used many times as a self-portrait. So you can see that here. I wanted you to see this. And then, of course, one of the very, very famous ready-mades that I showed you guys at the beginning of the semester is this one, right? This was the famous Mona Lisa ready-made 
that um, was done by Marcel Duchamp, right? And think about that. You talk about this guy being a button pusher and being kind of way out there, taking one of the most iconic works of art, certainly, right? The, the Mona Lisa and um, grabbing a, uh, a postcard of it and painting a, uh, a little mustache and goatee on her and renaming her. And by the way, um, naming her L-H-O-O-Q, which was the name he gave her, and in French, L-H-O-O-Q, it's actually a pun because when you say that really fast in French, it sounds like she has a hot ass. So again, he's a punster and he's making fun and he's laughing. Um, at, at kind of, you know, questioning, like, what is art, right? The most important works of art, and, but in this case, it's actually just a postcard that he found. Um, and, you know, the ready-made the ready is, is, is taking a mundane and often utilitarian object that's not considered to be art, like a urinal or like a postcard, and then transforming them by adding to them, by changing them, by renaming them, by drawing on them, um, and giving them something, some other way to be seen and some other, some other purpose, right? Some other artistic intent. And so this is why, and there are many more examples, but these are really the only ones I'm gonna show you today. This is why the ready-made is such an important um, work of art and such an important object to um, to this moment in time when we're just beginning to see that modern artists are questioning everything about what art is, right, and what art becomes. Um, let's see, how about we talk about this artist? Uh, we're going to talk about Mondrian. And this is another response to cubism that happens in um, Holland. And I want to just talk about him for a few minutes because he's a really important artist. <clears throat> so interestingly, uh, the De Stijl movement is connected. It's related in a way to what the, um, the Russian suprematists were doing. And I think you can see um, that there's kind of a similarity in terms of its non-objective nature. It was founded right around the same time in 1917 by a group of painters, sculptors, and, um, and architects. And we're actually going to look at a, an important piece of architecture today as part of this group. De Stijl literally means the style. And again, they are a group of artists who believe that there is this kind of uni universal monolithic style that anyone and everyone can relate to. That is all about harmony and balance and purity and form um, and color through this non-objective, this non-representational abstraction. And Piet Mondrian is a really interesting art, artist who kind of um, is the, the poster child for this particular movement. So imagine, you know, walking up to this Piet Mondrian painting in 1929, composition with red, blue, and yellow. And um, it was a pretty baffling experience for people. The canvas is small. It uses only the simplest of colors, red, blue, yellow of course, white and black. The composition is similarly reduced to the simplest of rectilinear forms, squares and rectangles, which are defined by horizontal and vertical lines. And one would hardly suspect that we are actually seeing the artist's determination to depict the underlying structure of reality. Right, And it's one thing to look at this work of art um, by Mondrian, and then it's another thing to think, well, in fact, this is not where he started. And I wanted to show you this portrait that he did of himself, right? So clearly he knows how to paint. He knows that there are other colors in the world besides the primary colors. 
Um, and I want to show you a really interesting kind of evolution that he does that I think is, is pretty, um, it explains kind of this idea that I'm trying to get to about moving from abstraction to non-objective art. So here, here's a painting that he did in 1908 of a tree. And if you see this painting, well, uh, you don't need to know that much about art to know that, okay, I get it. It's a tree, right? I recognize that. Um, and then he does a painting of a tree four years later, and this is what it looks like, right? So think about that. He goes from this to this, moving from abstraction towards non-objective art. Now, you see here the title is Flowering Apple Tree. But if that wasn't there, if we didn't know that the artist had named this the Flowering Apple Tree and we just saw this kind of um, without a title, we wouldn't necessarily know that, right? So I want you guys to look at this because I think it's a really beautiful example and explanation of the, the thought process of the artist, right? How he's moving um, away from realism, okay? And why is that? Mondrian believes that his abstraction could serve as a universal language that actually represented the dynamic and evolutionary forces that govern human experience, that govern nature. And in fact, he believes that abstraction provides a truer picture of reality than the illusionistic depictions of objects in the visible world. Okay? What's he saying? He says that this is a more accurate depiction of reality than someone trying to make, you know, paint a tree or make something look like a tree. And this is why Mondrian characters, his, characterizes his style not as abstract painting only, but he calls it abstract real painting. So it's a really interesting thing, and I love to show my students kind of the sketch he did of the tree and then these paintings, and you know, you get a better understanding of where he's moving, right? Also, this is a fun thing that we've done in class before where I show my students that he probably went out um, in 1914 on a little walk with his piece of charcoal. And you can see this, the sketch he did on the left of the facade, which means the front of a building. And you can see it's some sort of a tower and there's some letters here, some words, probably a sign. And, you know, we can see the chimney and it clearly looks like a building, right? Here's a lamp post. But then he goes back into his studio and he creates this painting from this sketch. Now compare these two. Do you see the abstraction from the sketch to the painting? Look at some of the diagonal lines. Look at the the kind of the squiggly guy over here. Is it, is it this, right? Is, is it the K-U-B? Is that what that is? And what about these arcs, right? And what about all these angles and these lines? And, you know, where do you see them in this image on the right? And I think when we talk about this idea of distilling things, of boiling things down to their essence, and we saw it with the Matisse, um, images of him painting Notre Dame out his window that we looked at a few classes ago. Um, this is a really beautiful example of exactly what we mean when we talk about abstraction and kind of distilling things to their essence. So I just want to show you a few more. Um, he, he spends a lot of time doing black and white compositions certainly primary color ones. And unlike Malevich, he actually does let go of making titles that refer to anything in the real world. And actually some of them even have kind of a musical title, composition in the color B, and you can see that here, right? Composition in black, gray, yellow, and blue. 
composition in blue, red, yellow, black. Notice the dates, right? 1922. So there's a, a wonderful video on YouTube if you guys want to take a minute now and watch it. You can, uh, or you can link to it through Khan Academy. Um, no problem to kind of stop the video and do that now. But I want to show you two more things by Mondrian. One is um, this. I love this self-portrait. Not the self-portrait that he draws on the right, although that one is kind of really cool in terms of how he is relating his, his self-portrait. And you can see how, how far he's come from this one, right? He's certainly come quite a long way. Let me see if I can um, cut and paste this for you guys right here. Oops, nope, forget it. Um, but you can see how this relates to his kind of very rectilinear, right? But I actually really love this one on the right. I really love this photograph because I want you guys to look at it for a minute, okay? And know, know and understand that every single thing, even though it's a black and white photograph, Every single, every single thing in this composition was clearly designed and laid out by Mondrian himself. So what does he do to create this composition to make it look like one of his paintings? Right, what does he do? He actually takes two pieces of paper and he thumbtacks them to the wall. And then he uses his easel, which is certainly the, the structure, the foundation upon which he creates all of his art, and then places himself in this composition in a way that we can relate to it as if it was one of his paintings. And I think it's so brilliant and so beautiful um, to, to think about, you know, imagine him in his studio on his wall, setting this whole composition up and then saying to whoever took the photograph, okay, now you can take my photograph. Now I have my still life, sorry, my self portrait set up in a way that, um, is exactly what I want to represent. So I thought that that was really cool. The last Mondrian, uh, work of art that we're going to talk about is this one called Broadway Boogie Woogie. And it's a really cool painting and you should definitely see that there are some major changes going on here. So Broadway Boogie Woogie is an important work of art because it represents a whole different phase in Mondrian's life. Um, and what's interesting is it's important to know that Mondrian had come to New York during the Second World War in the uh, early 1940s, maybe the late 1930s. I'm not sure exactly when he gets to New York. And he flees Europe, like many of the um, abstract artists, like many Jewish artists. Um, but he flees Europe to get away from the Nazis and is literally running for his life. And he moves to New York City and begins a whole new life as an older man. And he adapts to New York City with so much enthusiasm. He loves it. You can actually see that the first thing you'll probably notice that's missing from this painting is his characteristic black, his black lines. He develops a passionate enthusiasm for American jazz, and that's really what is trying, he's trying to capture in this painting. He was also a great dancer. He loved to go out um, to dance to live bands um, all around Manhattan. And so the title of the painting, Broadway Boogie Woogie, is really about his enthusiasm about New York City, this newfound freedom that he has, his escape from fascist, you know, Germany, um, and kind of the, the, the novelty that living in New York and jazz brings. Um, some people feel that, you know, the painting itself almost has a beat, right? It has a rhythm. It has the syncopated... Uh, rhythm of jazz. Some people have felt that perhaps it's almost like a, a floor plan, not a floor plan, a, an aerial view of the grid of New York City and the streets and the avenues and, and the buildings. And I think there's lots of wonderful ways to, to interpret the painting. Um, so I think I, I want you guys to just kind of understand the range of 
what um, Mondrian has really done as an artist. And this painting is at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and you can see it there um, and feel the rhythm of the painting uh, yourself. Hopefully one day you'll be able to go and see that. So how are these ideas, how are these principles of the distille uh, movement and all of these ideas that Mondrian is um, introducing, how are they translated into architecture and furniture? And you can see right here, there is an artist, uh, architect named Garrett Rietveld. And he is in fact taking some of these ideas that Mondrian is introducing and he is creating a piece of architecture, the famous uh, Rietveld house. Now I want you guys to look at this photograph that I have here for you, okay? And I want you to pay attention to the, not only the house, but the other houses that are surrounding the kind of the, um, the context. This is called the Rietveld Schroeder house. Schroeder is the, um, the name of the client, the name of the person who paid for the house. And it was built in 1924, 1924. So let's say this house is almost a hundred years old, right? And look, at this, right? Imagine that you were one of the people who lived in these houses, and in 1924, this thing gets built. Well, wow, right? How, how incredible, right? And how shocking, and how original, and how modern it still looks today. And it's, a, it's taking these kind of principles of um, everything that Mondrian was trying to explore, the black and the white, the red and the yellow and the blues, the primary colors, and this idea of these flat planes that can literally move and slide by each other. So that's why this little piece of roof here is sliding out because it emphasizes the fact that it's a flat plane instead of stopping back here. The same thing with this panel, right? Instead of it just kind of being in line with the bottom of this little balcony, which is all it would need to do to do the trick of you know, being a good banister, um, it slides by. Everything is kind of moving and passing each other. The same thing with the chair, right? Everything is kind of sliding and moving to emphasize that these are um, simply flat forms, rectilinear forms that uh, can, can move past each other. And I think it's a really beautiful um, example of taking um, ideas that were developed by Mondrian and then another artist explores them in a different medium and you can see I believe this is a photograph of uh, the installation at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, the interior of the house is kind of consistent with these ideas uh, and here you can see it's the Rietveld and Trust Schroeder Schrader house. Um, here's the chair that he designed and very early on, you can see these are tracks up in the ceiling that were for sliding panels. So you could close the space, you could open it up, you know, kind of a lot of modern ideas that we are still using and still exploring today in architecture. Um, but of course, it's relevant and exciting for us to notice that these were all things that were done in um, almost 100 years ago, right? So that's our lecture for today. We talked about a lot of really, really fun stuff of really good things. Um, kind of taking where we had left off with Picasso, beginning our discussion about art and what is art and how do artists in different geographic areas respond to cubism and respond to these questions. We talked about Italy and the Italian futurists. We talked about Russia and the Russian suprematists. We talked about Duchamp and his whole question about the ready-made and particularly the fountain. Um, we talked about Mondrian in uh, Holland and the De Steel movement and how this artist uh, explores kind of really the fundamental questions about art and then how it gets transformed into architecture.
So that's all I have for you for today. Next class, we're going to pick up and we're going to continue our discussion a little bit about architecture and uh, we're going to begin our discussion of surrealism. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.